Okay, recording progress. Okay, let's share my screen and make a start. Okay, everyone. Um, again, welcome to my session. Today, we're going to talk about how to eat well to manage your health. And uh, we're going to start by acknowledgement of country. So I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Okay, as I said, today is our second session. Um, if you didn't attend my first session, we, did, we do have a recording on the Westgate House website. Um, if you are interested, you can go there and have a look. Last time we talked about how to um, make up your plate healthily. And today we're gonna talk about the linkage between food and your health. So I will mainly focus on three things, blood glucose, blood cholesterol, and um, blood pressure. Hopefully that's um, something you are interested. And the next session is about food labeling. And the last session is about prevention is better than Q. Okay. So if you did attend my last session, we talked about um, to have a balanced diet is pretty important. A balanced diet can provide you um, essential nutrition that your body needs every day. But if you do eat right type of food, it can also help manage certain conditions. So our last session we'll talk about the, um, the energy balance or so the energy in and energy out. That's pretty much linked to your weight management. And today we're gonna mainly focus on the cholesterol, um, blood pressure and blood sugar, also called blood gluc glucose level. Some other things can be related to uh, eating right type of food, can be micronutrients, or um, um, we do have many cases of vitamin D deficiency and um, uh, some other micronutrient deficiency as well. Okay, so um, if you did attend my last session, hopefully you still remember my five different, different five groups. If you didn't, it's all right. So um, I wanna make a survey here to see how much you understand about the um, five different groups. So um, I will make up the poll and um, based on your knowledge, can you please select the correct five food groups we talked about last time? Or if you, um, not really sure, just um, based on your current knowledge, it's all right. Yeah, come on. <laughs> more voting, more involved. Cool. We got everyone voted. So yeah, um, we have all the people voted on grains and vegetables, which are correct. Um, and some other food groups include the meat and alternatives, which mainly provide us protein, uh, dairy and alternatives, which provides us calcium and uh, fruits as well. So these are the five food groups. So let's, I just let someone in. So these are the five different food groups we talked about in last session. Uh, so the vegetables and the legumes or beans, fruit, grain or cereals food, lean meat and poultry, including like fish, eggs, tofu, nuts, seeds, legumes, and beans. So they all belong to the protein source food. Milk, yogurt, cheese, and alternatives like soy milk. So they all belong to dairy and uh, alternatives groups. Sorry, if you want to know more details about this, you can uh, link to my previous session. 
Okay, so this is gonna be our main topic today, cholesterol. A word probably everyone is a bit afraid of. So um, what affects our cholesterol in the body? We have fats in our fruit, definitely affect, <coughs> sorry, definitely affects the um, cholesterol in our body. We have cholesterol in our food, so it's different from fat, like eggs. I would say egg contain high amount of cholesterol, but I won't say eggs contain high amount of fat and fiber. So with the fat, we do have good fat and bad fat. So not all the fats are bad fat. A uh, general rule would be uh, good fat is from plant, but we do have exemptions and the uh, bad fats are from animal sources. And cholesterol as well. Usually common sense animal source of cholesterol is not so good. Plant source is good. So I will explain more. So some facts about fat. If you do want to have um, control of your weight of you, or if you wanna, do, wanna lose some of weight, you should only eat small amount of fat. Um, so either good fat or bad fat, they both contain a high amount of energy. So they both energy dense nutrients. So fat is actually one of the most, I would say the most energy dense nutrient we have compared to um, carbohydrates, protein or alcohol. Fat is definitely the most energy dense. So if you do wanna control your weight, you need to make sure your fat intake is limited per day. And by controlling our weight, it's closely related to diabetes, stroke and heart disease risk, which I will explain more in our fourth session. So we do have good fats and bad fats. I'm not sure whether you have heard of Good fats include um, monounsaturated fats and polyunsaturated fats, and bad fat includes saturated fats and trans fat. So saturated fats are a type of natural fat that from animal source. Um, for example, our butter is very condensed with bad fat, very condensed with the saturated fats. Lard as well, the visible fat on our meat also contains a large amount of saturated fats. Trans fats um, usually present on highly processed food like our cereals, bread, or um, chips. Um, processed meat contain, definitely contain a high amount of trans fat. So saturated fats and trans fats are the two types of fats that we definitely want to avoid. And we want to use healthier fats to substitute our um, relatively, relatively bad fats. So we want to replace foods high in saturated fat with food with um, polyunsaturated fat and monounsaturated fats. So what kind of food that contains the unsaturated fats? So as I said, usually it will be from plant source like our um, peanut oil, peanut oil, um, olive oil, avocado, um, nuts, seeds. They all contain unsaturated fats. Other things will be including olive fish, which is an exemption. So like salmon, uh, tuna, tuna can. So um, they have a really good nutrient called omega-3 and they do have unsaturated fats, which is good for our cholesterol. Okay, so here we brought up a question. What do you think about coconut oil? Okay, um, I just make up the polls. There, here you go. So what do you think about coconut oil? Do you think it's um, a healthy fat option or um, it's definitely not a healthy fat, then we should limit it. 
or um, probably if we're using a small amount, probably not too bad, but um, if we use a large amount, probably not too good. Mm, I just heard someone is not muting themselves. David, I just want to mute you. Hopefully it's fine for you. Okay. So, um, or if you want to compare to butter, it's probably not um, that bad, as bad as butter or um, no harm, or are you not sure, just put not sure. Okay, I'll give you 10 seconds, 10 more seconds to think about. Yep, we have most of people voted. Okay, we have majority of people think yes, coconut oil is definitely a healthy fat option. Some of people think uh, no, coconut oil is something that we should limit. It's definitely not a healthy option. Some say uh, not sure, some say probably. Okay, so let me tell you a fact. Coconut oil actually contains 92% of saturated fat. So it's definitely not the ideal option that we want to use. Yeah, probably we have seen a lot of advertisements from TV, from media saying, ah, oh, coconut oil is very healthy. We should use them to replace our um, cooking oil or um, vegetable oil, which is not really true. So I would say um, coconut oil is something between butter and vegetables oil. So I would definitely not encourage you to use your coconut oil to replace your um, olive oil or vegetables oil. Um, the, the marketing, they say uh, coconut oil is relatively healthier is because it's not too bad as butter is, but actually chemical, um, the chemical structure of coconut oil actually acts similar to the ones from the animal source or so the saturated fat. So yeah, eggs. I'm pretty interested to know how often do you guys eat eggs or um, I'm definitely an egg person. So how frequent do you have eggs? Do you have it every day or um, more than one a day? Like me, I really love eggs. I just probably just has, have as many as I want. Some of them may say you don't want eggs because you don't like it or because you are pretty concerned about the cholesterol level in it. Yeah, I asked this question because um, I have many clients came to me saying they pretty concerned about the um, high intake of eggs and want me to explain. So um, I guess you guys would be also interested to know. I'll give you 10 more seconds. Okay. We have majority of people voted and the majority of people saying um, less than one a day. Some say I love eggs like me, just has, have as many as I want. Some say maybe not too many. And um, we do have one person try to avoid eggs due to impact on the cholesterol. Okay, so um, how does eggs affect our cholesterol? It's quite interesting that the Heart Foundations, they um, did a study about eggs, whether it's affecting on our cholesterol. 
So eggs definitely high uh, amount of cholesterol in eggs, and it's a very good protein source. I would say it's probably one of the cheapest protein source we can get from supermarket. And the protein from egg is actually a really good quality protein. But with our cholesterol and with our heart health, the study actually find out it has neutral relationship with our heart health, which means it doesn't do anything good and it doesn't do anything bad. So we can actually, if you don't have um, a lot of ongoing health conditions, you don't really need to limit your eggs intake. I would say um, the fat in our steak would be more, concern more concerning compared to the cholesterol in our eggs. But if you do have type two diabetes or um, if your cholesterol is already concerning and uh, the GP is doing some medical interventions with your cholesterol, at this time, you probably want to limit less than three, uh, seven eggs per week. So one egg a day is fine. It's definitely okay. So see, eggs are not too concerning, not as concerning as we thought. Okay, after talking about cholesterol in eggs, let's talk about cholesterol in plant. It's quite interesting that recent studies, they find out the cholesterol in our plant can actually lower our cholesterol in body, in our human's body. How amazing is that? Both of them are cholesterol, but they actually function differently. So um, some of the products that contains the plant sterile, which is the cholesterol from a plant, uh, you probably have seen this brand, uh, dairy, dairy farmers, heart active. This milk, they contain plant sterile. Or if you do eat wheat bix in the morning, you can switch to the cholesterol lowering wheat bix. So they do add some amount of plant sterile in that type of wheat bix. Or if you want to use margarine to replace your butter, then we have uh, Flora Proactive, we have Logical Health Plus, we have Netflix Pulse, and Woody Scott actually got their home brand of margarine, which has the um, plant sterile as well. And if you don't like any of these and you still want to try out the plant sterile, you probably want to come to the clinic and uh, have a chat with me to see whether we need to start some supplements. Okay, fibers. So fibers, they um, have two different types of fibers. Both of them pretty important for our bowel. And it's, for, it's important for our general uh, health being as well. So if you do wanna control your weight, high fiber foods, they are quite filling. So they can actually help satisfy our appetite longer, which helps with uh, weight control because you don't wanna, um, you won't be craving for any other food after you eat high fiber food. And uh, we do have two types of fibers. We have soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. So insoluble fiber is a fiber that cannot be dissolved in the water. So something like the skins on apples or uh, tomatoes, the skins on tomatoes. So the skins, they are generally insoluble fibers. And soluble fibers is more like um, a gel-like substance. If you have ever tried like Metamucil or Movico, you will find after you mix them, the solution becomes like gel-like substance. Or if you haven't tried any of the fiber supplements, you may find it when you make your porridge. So after you soak your oats and boil it, it also creates um, some kind of gel-like substance. So that's your soluble fiber. 
Okay, so back to insoluble fibers. Insoluble fiber is pretty important to maintain our bowel health. It may also help the prevention of some of the bowel cancers, such as colon cancer or rectal cancers. And soluble fibers, apart from the bowel health, it's pretty interesting that um, recent studies find out it can also help us to lower our cholesterol level, which links to what, are, what we are talking about today. So if you do want to have um, some of the soluble fiber to um, control your cholesterol, you can always um, come to the clinic and have a chat with me. Other things that I want to mention here, nothing to do with the cholesterol, more like our bowel health. So the fibers, actually they are the food. Um, a food of the bacteria in our gut. So we all know our guts have a lot of bacteria that are living with us. So they are good bacteria. And uh, it's quite interesting that um, a study find the bacteria is actually related to our um, mental health and uh, our body's function, like uh, immunity, um, any other uh, psycho psychological and physiological functions. So if we do have a good amount of fiber and feed them and make them happy, somehow we are happy together. So yeah, that's uh, about the cholesterol. Next thing I would like to introduce is about the blood, blood pressure. So um, some of the some of you may know um, salt is actually quite related to our blood pressure. So when we say salt, there, there can be two things that we mentioned. One is our dietary salt, so the salt in our salt shaker. The other thing is called sodium. So um, it's the main chemical substance that's in the, our uh, dietary salt. But we can also have other foods like highly processed foods. They contain a lot of sodium, but doesn't taste very salty. Okay, so we actually only need a small amount of sodium in our diet for our body to work properly. And too much sodium will lead to high blood pressure and has been linked to heart failure, kidney problems, stroke, and any other health conditions. So to reduce our risk, the recommendation is actually have six grams of salt, which is one teaspoon of salt a day. Convert to the sodium is around 2000 milligrams of sodium if you are interested. So some of the food we have can contain a large amount of the salt. The first one is the processed food. So something like our breads, our cereals, or um, even more highly processed food like our bacons, um, salamis. So they do have a quite amount of salt. Other salt can come from the salt, the dietary salt we add in during cooking process or in the salt shaker on our table. So some of the strategy we can do to limit our salt intake a day is probably avoid those very highly processed food like the bacon, salami, or um, you just want to make you just want to remove the salt shaker on your table and uh, replace the savory tastes in your dishes by other, any other flavor like um, the herbs or peppers. Okay, so here is our little game, little quiz. I want you to make a guess. I want you to make a guess how much sodium, so how much salt in those foods that made up our requirements in our body every day. So I have here. 
So the first one I want you to vote is the small bag of chips, 170 grams of chips. What is the percentage of the sodium in 170 grams of chips? Do you think contributing to our daily requirements? Ah, you all pretty smart. You all think the, it's a really, really high, <laughs> high sodium food, isn't it? Okay. So um, we have majority of people voting on 40 to 50%. One think 80% to 100%. And uh, four people think um, I have a bag of chips is already exceeding my amount of sodium a day. So the answer is 44 to 50%. So I actually checked um, different flavor, not just sea salt flavor. I actually checked different flavors of chips and uh, compare their sodium level. It's not much difference. So the highest one I find was 50 and lowest one I find was 44. So um, if you have two bags of chips a day, you already make, you already achieve your requirements for that day and you cannot have any other salt in that day. So it's quite interesting to know. Next thing, next thing would be the bacon. So think about, think about how much um, sodium in one slice of bacon that contribute to our daily requirements. Just one slice, just one. <laughs> Just one shortcut baker from Woody's home brand. Okay, time's up. So we have a lot of you selected more than 40%. So one slice of bacon is actually around 22% of salt. But um, if you have like four slices, it's gonna be 88% uh, of the requirements. But it's just like one slice of bacon. You still need to have a lot of other food that contain your salt. Okay, next thing is gonna be our um, cornflakes. So a cup of cornflakes, how much sodium in a cup of cornflakes contribute to our daily requirements? You all pretty smart. Choose lower than bacon. <laughs> okay, time's up. So majority of people think it's around a twenty percent. So the answer is one cup of cornflakes is about seven percent. If you do add milk in then there's actually some sodium in the milk as well. So if you add milk in, that's gonna be uh, make up to 11%. Okay, last one is our dinner roll. So one dinner roll, what is percentage of the sodium in one dinner roll do you think contributing to our um, 2000 milligrams of sodium requirements a day? Mm hmm Yeah, probably similar to our four flicks. Okay. So majority people think is around 10%, which is correct. So uh, one dinner roll is around 12% of um, our daily requirements of sodium. So probably one slice of bacon or one cup of cornflakes doesn't have that much sodium 
that you thought, but if you do think about you need to have three meals a day and you need to have those with other foods, you need to have um, the, the dietary thoughts added in our cookings, that's gonna be very easily to exceed the, our, um, the, da the daily amount. Okay, after the thought, we come to talk about sugar. So our blood sugar, or you may refer to blood glucose level. So these are the three things we um, generally say that would affect our um, blood glucose level. First one would be carbohydrates. Sometimes we refer them as sugar. So the white sugar is um, a kind of a variety of carbohydrates. Then we have fiber, I just talked about in the cholesterol section that fiber can help with our blood glucose as well. So I won't repeat here again. And protein, actually, if we do include a good amount of um, protein source and fiber source in our on our dinner plate, that's gonna help with our blood glucose management as well. So if you do wanna know how to make up your dinner plate, you can uh, refer to my previous session. Okay, so we, we will mainly talk about carbohydrates and sugar today. So not all the sugars are the same. We have naturally occurring sugar. So those are found in milk, in fruit, in vegetables, in legumes. So those generally, they will come along with uh, many other important nutrients like the, the milk can provide us protein and calcium. Fruit can provide us fiber, can provide us vitamins. So those we do encourage to include in our everyday diet. And we have added sugar. So they generally refer to uh, refined sugar and they are often added to food or drinks in a large amount to make the food or drink tastier. These foods and drinks often have low levels of other important nutrients. If you did attend my last sessions, we refer this group, this group of food as discretionary food, which only provides you energy, but not many other nutrients. So you may wanna ask me saying like, Alice, how about honey? How about maple syrup? They are naturally occurring sugar, aren't they? So they are, but if you think about honey or maple syrup, probably 99% of honey or syrup will still be sugar. So they don't actually provide you a lot of other good important nutrients. So we wouldn't um, encourage you to have a lot as well. Okay, so this is about today. Here are some take home message. So we did talk about um, food is linked to our health conditions and some of the chronic disease. And we revised the, the food different, the nutri nutrition in five different food groups. So we have vegetables, we have fruits, we have um, meat and alternatives, we have dairy and alternatives, we have grains. And we mainly focused on the cholesterol, blood sugar, and blood pressure. Hopefully the session today is gonna be helpful. So if you do wanna come to Westgate House and have a chat with me, um, you can always get a care plan from GP, which I can do bulk bill. Or if you are not eligible for um, the care plan, you can always come to see me privately with a small cost. Or if you have private insurance, then you can try to rebate with them. So yeah, so this is our session today. Our next session would be the next, the next Wednesday, 2nd of June, same time, 7 p.m. We're gonna talk about how to make sense of food labels. So 
I'm gonna go through how to choose a relatively healthier product when you do grocery in the supermarket. And if you can, if you do remember, um, you can always bring um, a food package to, a, to the next session. So next session, when I go through all the different labels on the food, you can have something that you can refer to. So I would recommend you to bring um, either like a tuna can or uh, um, I don't know, bag of chips, whatever in your home. Okay, do we have any question for today? Pretty quiet. <laughs> Thank you, Luisa. Thanks for your participation. Okay, if no one got a question, I will finish here to, for today. And I hope I can see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Yuji. Thank you, Joanne. Bye. Bye, Ursula. Bye. Thank you, Rosemary. Hopefully you have learned something from today. Thanks, Vicky. Thanks, Vanessa. Thank you, that was great. Thank you, Vanessa. Thanks, Charlie. I'll finish the recording here.